Hello and welcome. It's been a while since I've uploaded a video, so I figured I would do something interesting today. I wanted to share an aspect of development for Thrall that just got implement implemented recently, uh, and it's actually available in the new demo that uh, just got uploaded, uh, and that is color changing armor. Uh, so I found a way to do some pretty cool stuff with some cached graphics that allow me to have a bit more customization uh, when it comes to your characters in Thrall. And so what I'm just going to show you here is, if I go to Lionel here, he's wearing this uh, cationic armor here. If I unequip this, if you look at his sprite on the uh, window on the left there, when I unequip this, his sprite actually changes, and now he has that kind of blue armor and the blue cape. And when I re-equip the armor, his armor color changes to red. I think his cape is still blue. Yeah. Uh, but his armor is now red. Uh, so I found a way to make it so that when you equip different body armor, the character sprite will change color based on a couple of different factors. And I wanted to go into how I managed to make that work in this game. Uh, so just to kind of give you a brief rundown, I'm going to kind of showcase it, and then I'm going to actually show you uh, how I actually put it all together. So let's go chat with Emily here. Let's get some uh, let's get some new armors. There we go. And we will try these on. Let's just head outside where it's a bit brighter. So the way this works is that the color of your armor or cape will change color based on the color of the icon. Uh, so you can see with this fireproof robe, it, it looks like kind of a green cape. So if I equip this, Lionel's cape will actually turn green. And then his armor will change color based on a different parameter that I'll get into later. So if I equip this, you can see that his armor stayed red, but his cape is now green instead of the blue that it was before. And if I equip, say, this healthy cape, uh, it will st it still has the green icon, so his cape will stay green, but his armor will likely change color now because of the different parameter. And yep, now his armor turns blue, but he still has that green cape. So the way this works is that any icon uh, for an item that is cloth-based, whether it's a cloak, a cape, a robe, clothes, uh, will change uh, the cloth portion of the character's sprite. So. For example, this fireproof cape had red armor with a uh, green cape. Mel is the only one who's a bit different. Her mantle is sort of like the armor portion, and then her skirt is the cloth portion. So this will change her shoulders and her mantle to red, and her dress to green. Just like that. Uh, if I took this same armor and I equipped it to Damien, his cape would turn green, but his armor would stay red. And if I just switch to Damien here, you can see he's got that red armor and that green cape. Uh, now, the way that works, though, is that if you have a uh, actual armor, like a, like this reviving or this cationic armor, uh, instead it will actually change the color of their armor, and then the cape will be determined by that uh, parameter that kind of randomizes it a bit. So with this, you can see the icon for the reviving and the cationic armor. It's actually the same icon. Uh, and it's kind of got like a little bit of red detailing there. So this is what makes their armor red, whereas the cape is actually determined by that arbitrary value. Uh, and what that value actually is, is there is the defense stat of that armor. Uh, so the way it works is that it actually takes uh, the defense, um, divides it by six, and then takes whatever's the remainder of that, and the remainder uh, d is what determines that arbitrary value. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to go into a little bit more about how that worked. Here, let's go with the, because I just kind of showcased the same kind of colors of icons. Let's try the stable cape. So this should change Damien's cape to red and then his armor to a different color. So his armor is now green, but his cape is red. And then with this cloak, you can see the icon is black, so his cape should turn black. Uh, and I think his armor is actually going to stay green. Yep, so his armor stayed green, but his cape is now black. Now, there were a couple of things I had to figure out with this to make it work in things like cutscenes, and I will get into that in a second. But first, 
I want to show you how I did this. So the first thing is in game actor in the script editor this is rpg maker vx i modified the change equip script method and what i did was i actually created an array full of arrays uh, that have three values in each one uh, the first value is the icon index uh, the second value is the i believe it is the color that the armor should change to and then the third value is the color that the cape should change to uh, and so by doing this i actually have a couple of armors uh, some of the legendary and unique armors that will hard code changing the color of both the cape and the armor to a specific color but in most cases so let's take this one here if you find an armor with an icon index of 630 and this is our uh, icon uh, set here. So 630, let's just uh, randomly say it's this one here. If you find an armor with this icon, regardless of what other uh, prefixes or stats that it generates, if it generates with this specific icon, what it will do is it will set the armor to zero and then it will set the cape to four. And what this does is when you actually change the body armor of the character, what it will do is it will first, uh, it, it will not do this for just if you're comparing, but only if you actually equip it. What it will do is it will first trim the character name. Now character name is basically the name of the sprite that that character is using. It will trim the character name to make sure that the there are no numbers at the end of the name. This is where naming schemes are a little bit important uh, with your file names. So it trims it down just to its base default character name. So for example, with Brutus, it would trim the name to just dollar sign Brutus. Then what it will do is it will iterate through the icons that we've established here. And if the icon index of that item is equal to the first parameter, that's when it actually will change the graphic here. So what it does is it uh, checks the first and the second uh, parameters, uh, like these two parameters here. And it will then also take the defense of the item and essentially get the remainder of it. And then what it will do is if the... Hmm, how do I say this in the way that makes the most sense? Essentially, if it's equal to zero, that means it randomly selects based on the defense of the item. If it's set to an actual value greater than zero, it hard codes it to that value. And then what it does is it takes the character name, in this case, let's say Brutus, and it concatenates those values to the end of the name. Then within the actual game character folder, those values are determined here. So for example, this isn't actually Brutus 11, this is Brutus 1, 1. Same with this, this isn't Brutus 12, this is Brutus 1, 2. And what that means is 1 basically means red, 2 means green. So what we're saying here is Brutus 1, 1 has red armor, red cape. Brutus 1, 2 has red armor, green cape. Brutus 1, 3 has red armor, blue cape, etc, etc. And I basically have 36 different sprites for that character within this folder. It says up to 66, but it's actually only 36 because I have six different colors that each armor and cape can be set to. It then actually sets the character sprite to that new variable that we've set, and then it refreshes the game player, and that's how the character graphic gets changed. That's actually fairly simple. Where it gets challenging is during cutscenes. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's do something a little bit interesting here. So let's go... Hmm. Okay, hold on. Uh, member 4, I think, is what we need. So I'm going to take this out. And then I'm going to show you exactly what happens when our character graphics are... Let's see, that's the one. When our character graphics are altered by the armors that we have equipped, but then we go into a cutscene where there's events on screen instead of the actual players. So as you can see, Mel has green and black uh, outfit, 
Lionel's red and blue, and Damien is red and white. If I go, I'm gonna have to set some variables to make sure this works properly. Set that to zero. Oh, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. Oh, I should go full screen for this. Okay, let's try this again. Alestin set to zero, and if we go to Alestin, what should happen is a cutscene will play. Ah, I think I did something wrong here. Let me take a look here. Let's see if this works. Okay, yeah, I did I did do something wrong. What did I do wrong? Hold on a minute. Oh, right, because it's not member three, it's member four. Okay, let's try that again. There we go. Yeah, member three means Brutus is missing. Member four means Damien is missing. Okay, this should work now. We're going to get some interesting graphical glitches as a result of this, but it will be fine because we're going to fix it and I'm going to show you how it all works now. Okay. So as you can see, Damien, Lionel, and Mel have their specially colored armors, but if we go to Alestin, the cutscene that plays has them in their default outfits, as you can see. So Lionel's got that blue armor, blue cape, Damien's got like the brown armor and the purple cape, and Mel is all blue. And what will actually happen is when they kind of show some character expressions, like uh, a little bit of sadness or, you know, whatever happens there, uh, their character sprite is actually going to... Uh, so what happened with Mel right there, see how she kind of looks like her eyes are like half shut and sh like her head kind of sunk down a bit? That's an expression, uh, which is a separate sprite sheet altogether. Uh, now, in order to make this have these characters wearing the outfits that they actually have equipped takes a little bit of work because in this event here, this is set to this event or this sprite sheet. If I was to do this evented, I would have to basically create every combination of potential character sprite sheet like to match whatever possible outfit combinations you could have that would be absurd and not worth the effort but if I don't want to break immersion and make it so that you know they're just wearing their default outfits instead of the armors that you have actually equipped to them what we're going to do instead is we're going to call a common event at the start of this cutscene uh, called cache graphics and what that common event is is actually not that much there's a very small amount of code here, but what it does is within this first uh, script, we're going to set the character graphics, um, we're going to cache them, and then call those cached graphics within the event. Uh, so it, it basically we're temporarily changing it. Uh, so what we've got here is we've got our, uh, we're basically just establishing our X and Y coordinates. We're setting a rectangle to 0, 0, 96, and 192. And the reason for that is this is our starting X and Y coordinates, and then these are the X and or the width and the height coordinates. And those are set to, as you can see here, dimensions 96 by 192. That is the size of our sprite sheet for these characters. Uh, each one is 32 pixels wide and 48 pixels high uh, for each cell within this sprite sheet. So that's what those are for. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through all of our game actors. So from I in 1 to 4, uh, we're going to set a variable to the game actor's character name, which is actually the name of their sprite sheet. And then we're going to set name a variable to the character's actual in-game name, such as Mel or Lionel or Damien or whatever the character's name is. Then what we're going to do is we're actually going to cache... Uh, the, we're going to set B equal to the uh, cached character, uh, basically the sprite sheet that the character actually has set to them. So whatever their sprite is based on the armor that you have equipped. And we're going to set a variable to the, uh, to the cached... Uh, basically what we're doing here is we're dollar sign name. That basically is like saying 
we're setting that to this here, which is the sprite that is actually used in cutscenes. And then what we're going to do here is a block transfer, uh, or BLT. Not the sandwich. Um, so this is a block transfer. What we're going to do is we're going to do a block transfer at X, Y, uh, with B and R. And what that means is X and Y, 0, 0. We're basically taking this cached graphic at coordinate X and Y, 0, 0. That's our starting coordinates. We are then going to, oh, sorry, hold on, um, take this here. So the sprite that we changed the character to, uh, we are referencing that within this rectangle. And we're transferring it into C. So basically what we're doing is we're temporarily overwriting this graphic that is used in the cutscene with the graphic of the character like based on whatever armor they have equipped. I'm not doing a great job of explaining this, um, but the nice thing about cache, uh, caching graphics is that you can basically do this as, as a way to temporarily overwrite the graphics that are there. But that just works for the one sprite. So then the question becomes, how do we then do that for all the character expressions? Uh, just as an example, let's see here. Okay, so uh, partway into this cutscene, member one will have their graphic changed to expression one. These are all the character expressions that exist, at least at this point in the game. Um, what we need to do is we need to make it so that these expressions use the equipped armor. Uh, now there is a slight pixel offset uh, with their head graphic, they're about one pixel down, so we can't just uh, overwrite it. What we actually are going to have to do is we're going to take this sprite sheet, we're going to clear all of this part of it here, we're going to then copy in the character sprites into each individual uh, cell where, they, where that character gets referenced, and we're going to take these heads and copy them over top as well. Now what we've done for that is I actually have in this character folder a separate folder of all the characters, uh, I guess you could say, like their, their armors, uh, just without the heads. So all the same armor colors and uh, setups that are possible for all the characters are there, just without the heads, uh, and then the heads are actually, oh, we don't need that anymore, uh, the heads are actually in that expressions, where is it here? I think it's at the bottom. Yeah, it is. Um, all the characters' uh, expressive heads are at the bottom of this sprite sheet here. So what we're going to do is, in that common event, we're going to cache the character expressions into C. We're going to create a new rectangle, uh, and this one is, again, same thing, X, Y, 0, 0, and then 96, 192. And what we're going to do is we're going to clear within the character expression at starting coordinates x and y, we're going to clear uh, a width of 384 and a height of 192. So what we're essentially doing is we're clearing all of this. From there what we're going to do is once again iterate through the game actors and uh, we're going to take the x coordinate at i minus 1, so uh, i technically is uh, at 1, so what we're going to do is i minus 1 is 0, uh, so 0 times 96 is 0, so we're basically starting up in the corner here. Uh, we're going to set the name to the game actor's character name, or whatever character sprite they currently have equipped, uh, and then we're going to cache the heads, so uh, I actually have in-game system here, a way to reference this specific folder here. Uh, and then I basically were taking the uh, the name, the character name, that character sprite, plus the letter H, because that is within the naming scheme here. And then again, we're going to do a block transfer uh, into character expressions, and we're going to uh, start at the X coordinate that we established up here. Uh, y of 0, that will never change. Uh, we're going to reference the basic graphic and then 
copy it in from that rectangle. Hope that makes sense. Um, so we're gonna basically what we're doing is we're taking that character expression. Oh, wrong folder. We're taking this here and we're. Did I already have that open? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. Basically, what we're doing is we're starting at uh, this coordinate here, and we're copying Lionel's character graphic into this spot. Then we're iterating through, and we're copying Nell's graphic into this spot, and then we're copying Damon's graphic into this spot, and then Brutus's graphic into that spot. Uh, and then the next thing we would do is once we've copied all their bodies, their headless bodies from that folder that I showed you earlier into those spots, then what we're going to do is we're going to take, I shouldn't have closed that, what we're going to do is we're going to take x of 0, y at 192, a width of 384, and a height of 192. We're basically taking all of these heads, and we're then going to do another block transfer to the same spot, but it's basically overwriting the entire section here. It's pasting those heads on top of the headless bodies that we just copied in. And by doing that, that was maybe a little bit technical and um, not very well explained. I'm not exactly the most, um, I'm not the best with words sometimes, especially when it comes to technical things. I can go full screen for this. Oh, I do have to set the variable again. So now we have all these distinct unique colors on our armors. If we go to a less than now and that same cutscene plays, because we ran that event at the start that caches their graphics the way that we just established, now they're all actually wearing their specific armors. Even though these are not game players, these are game events. And as you can see right away here, the character expression changes with that as well. So it's a little bit complex. It's definitely more in-depth than, I think, your basic event systems. Um, but it works quite well, in my opinion, and it just, I think, adds quite a bit more to the immersion. Um, this video is just kind of a, a way to showcase uh, the power of being able to cache graphics and then uh, do block transfers and temporarily overwrite uh, those graphics. There's a lot that you can actually do with that. This actually, I think, is a fairly basic application of that. Uh, there's things you can do with cached graphics that allow you to completely change uh, the layout of certain maps. Uh, it won't necessarily change your collision, but it could change uh, your parallaxes. It could change all sorts of different cool things. Uh, so block transfers and cache, uh, caching graphics can actually be very powerful when used effectively. Uh, and you just need to be a little bit creative with it. Uh, it's definitely, yeah, it's more of an advanced concept, though. It's definitely not something that uh, beginner... Uh, beginners with RPG Maker would likely make a lot of use out of. But at the same time, uh, the only way you're really going to get good at it is if you try it and practice. So, yeah. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. Um, yeah, probably way more technical and way over the heads of um, most people, and that's fine. It's uh, more just wanting me wanting to get back into the habit of uploading again. So, uh, here you go. And, uh, I'm going to try to get back into the schedule of uploading one video a week again here. So I want to start with this. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.